Our call to worship is from Psalm 119. God, teach me lessons for living so that I can stay the course. Give me insight so I can do what you tell me. My whole life, one long, obedient response. Guide me down the road of your commandments, for I love traveling this way. Father, we present ourselves in expectation and praise. This hour, let your love so invade and touch us that we become lovable. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first hymn is, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, 466. There is a prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. After we confess our sin to God together, there will be a moment of silence so that you can have time to confess your own personal sin. Eternal God, whose precepts are just and true, and whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we have failed to fulfill your will for us. We have betrayed our neighbors and deserted our friends and run in fear when we should be loyal. Though you have bound yourself to us with eternal love, we have not bound ourselves completely to you. God, have mercy on us, weak and willful people. Lead us once more to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our bread of life and the vine from which we grow in grace. Amen. David wrote, when I kept these things to myself, I felt weak deep inside. And I moaned all day long, and my strength was gone as in the summer heat. But then I confessed my sins to you and did not hide my guilt. I said, I will confess my sins to the Lord, and you forgave my guilt. And he forgave us too. Please. <laughs> May be seated. It is always our great joy as a congregation when we have the privilege of receiving new persons 
into the fellowship of our church. And such is the occasion today when we want to invite forward Audrey Shiprack and her sponsor, Cal Parks, if you'll come on up to the chancel. And also, uh, we're going to receive Grover and Ann Godwin. And then a little later in the sacrament of baptism, we'll receive as a baptized member their cute little five-month-old son, Tyler. So this is a very special occasion for, for us today. And their elder sponsor is Brad Craig. Grover and Ann and Audrey, you do not come to us as strangers, but as sisters and a brother in the Christian faith. We welcome you as part of the Universal Church of Jesus Christ to this part of God's vineyard at First Presbyterian Church. The scriptures tell us that there's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and in all and through all. I direct this question to you because you're coming by transfer from other Christian bodies. Uh, Audrey is coming from uh, the Lutheran Church in Ontario, Canada, and uh, Grover is coming to us from a Baptist church, and Anne is transferring her membership from uh, an Episcopal church in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we're so glad that the uh, Godwins are compromising. We Presbyterians are the people of the middle way, and we're glad that uh, they have decided on that. This question, therefore, is one that I direct to you. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and so fulfill your calling as disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord? Well, these folks are received into the church, and they will be here at the chancel steps after the service this morning. We would encourage you to come by and give them a welcome and the right hand of fellowship into this uh, church. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for Grover and for Ann and for Tyler and for Audrey and for the rock from which they're hewn, the people who have affected their lives, who've touched them. Lord, they bring a lot to this congregation and we thank you for them. We also thank you that there is a family here, a place of safety. We ask that you would bind all of our hearts together as we get to know each other and you better. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Welcome to you, Audrey. God bless you. Carol, thank you. Yeah, the doctors will be seated. We'll ask. Uh, the Godwoods to remain so that we can proceed with the sacrament of baptism. Dear friends, the sacrament of baptism is of divine ordinance. God our Father, who has redeemed us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is also the God and the Father of our children. They belong with us who believe to the membership of the church through the covenant which has been made in Jesus Christ and which has been confirmed to us by this sacrament he instituted. This sacrament is a sign and seal of our cleansing from sin, of our union with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and our welcome into the household of God. Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Grover and Ann, there are, four, there are questions, vows that, that I'll ask you and you respond and we'll be asking God to be with you to give you the strength to raise this little guy. Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in Him? Do you intend, Tyler, to be His disciple, to obey His word and to show His love? Do you? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized 
do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Tyler Adelai Godwin, the good news of the gospel to help him know all that Christ commands and by your fellowship to strengthen his family ties with the household of God? The congregation will respond by saying, we do. We do. Let us again look to God in prayer. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ, for the ministry of your word and the sacraments of grace. We're grateful that you call not only us, but also our children to be included in the family of God, marking them with this sacrament as a singular token and pledge of your everlasting love. Set apart now this water from its common to this sacred use, and grant that what we now do upon earth may be confirmed eternally in heaven. And as in humble faith we present little Tyler to you, we ask you to receive him, to endue him with your Holy Spirit, and to keep him as your own. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You hold him and I'll baptize him that way. Tyler, Adelaide Godwin, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and abide in your heart forever. Little Tyler is now received into Christ's church, and you, the members of this congregation, have promised that you will be his sponsor to the end, that he may be able to grow and be nurtured in his faith in Jesus Christ, and one day, in the age of accountability, stand before this congregation or a similar one to affirm as a young adult that he belongs to Jesus Christ. God be the glory. And now it's time, I think, to take the walk down the aisle. Tyler, let's see if I can manage that. Now, you're a very inquisitive young man, and you want to be able to see out to everything, don't you? And boy, he's heavy, too. Right? <laughs> he's well fed. These look like relatives. Is that the case? Well, he's a precious boy, isn't he? We're glad you're here today. And as we introduce Tyler to the congregation, Tyler, I want to tell you that this is your new church family. These are people who have promised to be those who support you and pray for and encourage you as you grow up by providing the church and the Sunday school and the youth activities. Right now, a good nursery that will care for you and will help you as you grow and develop and come to understand what it means to be a Christian disciple. And we pray for your parents, too. They've got a wonderful, exciting, but awesome responsibility. <laughs> Let's, let's pray again. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Tyler. We ask your blessing on him. We ask that you would pull and tug on his heart, that you would whisper in your mysterious way and call him to your side. And I ask that you would give Grover and Ann just the words to say when he has those questions, those unanswerable questions. You would show them what to say, to pray with and for him so that he would grow up to be your own. We thank you in Jesus' name. And uh, Mike, you've got the baptismal sure certificate. Do. And the congregation will now sing our baptismal hymn for an infant baptism, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Let's all stand.
overseas. As we've welcomed these new members and Tyler into the fellowship of our church, we also want to expand that welcome to include all of you who are in the pews of this sanctuary today, and also to include those of you who are worshiping with us by means of television. One word to our television congregation, we are grateful for your faithfulness and for the fact that so many of you in nursing homes, shut in in your own home, uh, tune in this worship service every Sunday and then several times as it's broadcast through the week. We want you to know that you have our prayers and we do sincerely appreciate your prayers and support on the behalf of this television ministry of First Presbyterian Church. We ask everyone to take the friendship pad that is uh, located on the center aisle end of your pew and Write in your name and the other pieces of information that are requested there. Pass it down the pew to the other end so that everyone will have a chance to sign in. Uh, if you are a visitor, please indicate that. Give us uh, your name and, and especially your telephone number. We'd like to give you a brief call just telling you how much we have appreciated your presence here today. Also, if you are a visitor, there is a card in the pew rack with a little red ribbon which might help our congregation to more easily identify you as a visitor in church today. We ask everyone to speak to one another before you leave, not only those in the pew with you, but those behind you and in front of you. Don't hesitate to, to speak before you leave the sanctuary this morning. After the service, there will be a time of coffee and fellowship in the Balkan Parlor. We invite not only our visitors, but also our members to come. There will be some church officers there too to greet, and I will be there and Mike will be there after we greet people at the doors. If you are interested in becoming a member of First Presbyterian Church and do not know exactly how that takes place, there will be an elder after the service in this room through the door there and that person will be very happy to answer your questions and to give you guidance on how one can make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized if you've never been baptized uh, as a young person or an adult, how you can join by transfer or other means of making uh, the change and, and becoming a part of this particular congregation. I think that's all that we need to say by way of announcement, except that we're glad that we can be together here in God's house. Our Lord has preceded us here. He's waiting to bless us, waiting to meet our needs. All he asks is that we open the eyes of our spirits, that we may see and open our ears to hear what his word has to say to us and for us this day. May God bless you all as we worship together. And now let us sing an old gospel hymn that everyone knows and loves, number 341, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Please be seated. Martin Luther once wrote that the um, Word of God is alive. It runs after me. It takes hold of me. As we read these passages from the Old Testament and Psalms, may it take hold of us too. Familiar passage from Exodus 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Then Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the word of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We continue now our reading, and we turn now to Mark chapter 12, and we'll read verses 28 through 34. As Mike read the Old Testament passage from Exodus 20, you heard again the Ten Commandments. They're in the context of Israel. They're wandering in the wilderness and their movement toward the Promised Land. And then in Psalm 19, as he read it, uh, it tells us something of the practical benefits of the law of God, the commandments, how they can be a blessing to the person's life who meditates upon them and uses them and applies them rightly into their living. And then we come to this last passage where Jesus summarizes the law in two ways. Uh, there was a discussion with some Sadducees and some scribes, and they were debating constantly the law and its meaning for life. And so we take up reading in verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. May God bless to our understanding and to our growing spiritual enrichment is the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let's look to God in a moment of prayer. O Lord God, rightly interpret to us your word of truth, that we may be doers of that word and not hearers only. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Do you think that the Ten Commandments are relevant for our life today? I'm confident that most of us gathered here in this sanctuary this morning would respond to that question with an emphatic yes. Of course we believe that. But for many people out there in our world today, they find the Ten Commandments to be something very different, something which seems to them to be harsh and repressive. In fact, they chafe at the thought of anything which might limit their right to choose or to behave as they wish. Maybe they're like the little boy who was practicing for his not tying merit badge in the boy scout room in the church basement. In the course of his practice, he produced a very large, strange looking knot that he had never seen before and try as he might, he simply could not untie it. So in a sense of some desperation, he took it to a fellow scout and said, look, I've invented a new knot. Why, that's great, replied his friend, impressed. Uh, what are you going to name it? What are you going to call it? It'll have to have a name. Well, the boy, in a little bit of confusion, thought for a moment, and then looking up on the scout room wall at the framed plaque of the Ten Commandments that was posted there, he responded, well, I think I'm going to name it the Thou Shalt Not. <laughs> and likewise, there are many people in the world today who think of the Ten Commandments in negative terms as a list of thou shalt nots which entangle them, which tie them up in ways that they do not want to be tied, which threaten to dampen their fun and to restrict their freedom to behave just as they want. And I suppose we'll have to admit that the truth of the matter is that eight of the Ten Commandments do contain thou shalt nots, which prohibit certain actions and behaviors as displeasing to God. They are indeed Ten Commandments, not just Ten Suggestions. Therefore, some people today have sought to limit the role of the commandments, not only in their private lives, but also in the public arena as well. This was the case just last week down in the state of Alabama, where a civil liberties group brought a law school, lawsuit asking that the Ten Commandments uh, be removed as an engraving from the walls of the state Supreme Court building in Montgomery. But Alabama Governor James responded in that good old Alabama tradition by stating that if the Ten Commandments were to be removed from the walls of the Supreme Court building, they would have to be removed by the force of arms. But despite the governor's resistance, there are many people out there today who feel that such religious sanctions as the Ten Commandments have no place in our public or secular life. But are the Ten Commandments really all that negative? Did God give these commandments to ancient Israel as an affliction, as a killjoy, as a legalistic burden that they were forced to bear? Well, as I read the context of the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments, as Mike read the commandments here today, I get an entirely different impression in that context. 
The Bible describes there how the Ten Commandments were given to a struggling group of refugees wandering in a trackless wilderness out in a desert. They were in desperate need of help and hope, of structure and discipline. And one day, as they stood trembling at the foot of Mount Sinai in the midst of a violent thunderstorm, they watched their leader, Moses, ascend up the mountain, on up into the clouds, there to meet with their God, Yahweh. And so it was in a moment of high drama that God gave the commandments, not as a curse to these people, but as a blessing. In their time of deepest need, they were given by God a covenant of love, which would establish an everlasting bond and relationship between these people and their loving Heavenly Father. And God gave the rationale for the commandments in his very first line, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In other words, they were a gift and a guide from the Almighty One who had first taken the initiative to save his people, to redeem them from the bondage of enslavement that they had experienced in that alien land. They who were no nation, they who were no people, were now a holy nation, a royal people, chosen, uniquely selected by God. But of course, as is the case in every covenant, they in turn had their responsibility. First, they were called upon to respond to God's love by putting Him first in everything, by loving Him in the way that He had loved them. And that meant that they would have no other gods before him. They would not worship any pagan idols, any graven images. They would refuse to take the name of the Lord their God in vain. And they would keep one day in seven holy for worship unto the Lord. And furthermore, in response, they were to love their fellow persons as themselves. And they were to do this by beginning with honoring their parents by respecting the sanctity of human life, not committing murder, by practicing fidelity in all of their marriage relationship, by not stealing, by not speaking dishonestly, by not coveting those things which belong to their neighbor. And if the Israelites lived according to those commandments, God promised things would go well for them. But if they failed to obey, they would be courting disaster and judgment. But you ask, that's ancient history. What do these Ten Commandments mean for our life today? Well, let me say for one thing, they can be and should be the basis for our personal conduct, both moral and spiritual. And they are also the basis for our ultimate peace and prosperity in the living of our life. The Bible has said the fool has said in his heart there is no God, but it's only the fool who would think himself big enough and strong enough and smart enough to violate the unchangeable laws of the eternal God and expect that he could get by with it. No person ever breaks God's law. That person ultimately in the final word is going to break only himself. You recall, as Mike read it, how the psalmist wrote of some of the practical benefits of studying and meditating upon the commandments there in that passage in Psalm 19. The psalmist said, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And who of us here today would not want joy and, and wisdom and to be revived in our spiritual being? And that, says the psalmist, is the promise when we meditate upon and apply the commandments to our living. You see, the Ten Commandments are just as valid and practical for our life today as they were for the Israelites more than 3,000 years ago. They're not obsolete moral imperatives intended to shackle us with arbitrary burdens, 
Rather, they are the foundational principles that lead to human happiness, and anyone who follows them will experience a new sense of personal peace and joy. And then the Ten Commandments provide today, just as they have for many, many centuries, the moral and ethical foundation for all human relationships, all of our social relationships. Now, it's certainly self-evident that if a group of people are going to expect to live together, there have to be certain rules and guidelines and laws, and all must agree to stick by them. Most of us, I'm sure, have had the experience sometime in life of trying to play a game with someone who simply refused to abide by the rules. I can tell you it's no fun to play golf or bridge with someone, for instance, who tries to twist all the rules to their own advantage. The ultimate result of that kind of situation is chaos and a great deal of anger and resentment. Well, the same principle applies to a community, to an entire nation, and to a congregation even within a church. It's impossible to live harmoniously in any type of human community without laws and without those laws being kept. But is it not precisely a crisis of ethical standards that we are facing in human society as we come to the close of the 20th century? For many generations in America, the moral and ethical principles of Christendom formed the foundation of the life of our society. Now, of course, not everyone through those years obeyed the laws. There were many crooks, many criminals, many scoff laws who did not obey, but at least there was general agreement, even though not everyone obeyed, that these laws were nevertheless just and right. But that, you see, is no longer the case. As we approach the end of the millennium, our time-honored Christian ethic has come under attack and it is being supplanted by a number of other standards. For example, a survey was taken back in 1940 asking teachers to describe their seven most serious problems in dealing with classroom students. And the problems they listed in 1940 were these, students talking out of turn, chewing gum in the classroom, making noise, running the halls, cutting in line, dress code infractions, and loitering around the school property or in the school building. Another similar survey of teachers was taken in this past decade, and teachers of our generation listed their seven most serious problems which impact their work in the classroom as these. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, teen pregnancy, suicide, robbery, rape, and assault. The contrast is shocking, but I don't think any of us here today is surprised. It's obvious to all of us that our society is beset by incredible disorder, crime, distress, and terror. Many citizens right here in our community, ordinary people, spend literally thousands of dollars on home security systems. They live behind locks and bars, virtual prisoners in their own homes in some cases. It's all too frequently that we hear of persons who are worshiping right here in this sanctuary, having their cars that are parked out there on the street broken into and robbed while they are here in church trying to worship and praise their God. In many cases, family life today is a shambles Young people are regularly exposed to violence, obscenity, abuse, and drugs. The marketplace sees with greed, is, uh, with greed and corruption and cutthroat competition. Our legal system has often become so entangled and undependable that it often imposes more of a hardship upon the victims than it does upon the guilty. And our government has grown more and more expensive and unwieldy and yet it seems less and less responsive to real human need. And even religion has had its share of sexual and financial scandals, while many churches seem insensitive to the spiritual poverty of so many out there in our communities. What in the world has gone wrong with our world? What happened to those days when the streets were safer, when the schools were secure, 
And when the only drugs in town were dispensed across the counter in the corner pharmacy, when was it that we lost control? Well, I don't suppose there are any easy answers, but I'm sure that a part of the problem is the result of our basic loss of faith and the growing secularization of our society and culture. When millions of people are being crammed together in urban areas without the foundational advantage of a common shared belief in God and ethical standards derived from the Ten Commandments, we simply can't expect them to behave as if they are on a, a Sunday school picnic. The weakening of mainline religion in America, too, has contributed to the decline in, in the moral standards. It's made us particularly vulnerable to what someone once called the acids of modernity. And unless we somehow rediscover the law of God and its formative role in our society, we will be condemning ourselves by default to live by the law of the jungle. And then the Ten Commandments are vitally relevant to us today, not just because they provide guidelines for personal and corporate living, but also because they have the ability to motivate us to be compelled to seek the mercy and forgiveness of our loving God. The great Protestant reformer John Calvin liked to point out that when the Ten Commandments are fully understood in all their depth and implications, they can become like a spiritual mirror revealing to us our own sins and flaws and blemishes of our soul. And they can prompt us to come back in humility to God with confession and repentance of our sins. But a number of years ago, the famous psychiatrist Carl Menninger wrote a book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin? And even more recently, someone has authored a book which raises the question, Whatever Has Happened to Shame? And what indeed has happened to our concepts of sin and shame in our society? That They seem to be forgotten relics in our contemporary living. Well, let me tell you that the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament knew what it was to be aware of a sense of sin and shame. He tells us there in the sixth chapter of his prophecy how he went to church one day. And while he was there, he beheld a vision of God high and lifted up in all of his purity and glory. And against the white hot background of that holy God, Isaiah began to see himself as he really was for the first time in his life. He was keenly aware of his own sinfulness. And with sobs of contrition, he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Now, such poignant confessions of sin really aren't the fashion in our day. Oh, we do confess after our fashion, but our confessions, generally speaking, don't burst forth from our lips, red with shame, and from our hearts, wet with the tears of genuine contrition. And what is it that lies behind our lost sense of our sin and failure well, again, various reasons might be given, but I think one of the main reasons is because we have lost our sense of the glory, the purity, the holiness of the living God. And where can we recapture a new vision of God as he is in all of his righteousness and purity and holiness? Well, according to old John Calvin, we can discover that God in the Ten Commandments if we'll meditate upon them deeply, if we will apply their meaning and implications to our lives, if we will seek to, to make them relevant to our inner character as well as our outer behavior, we will be compelled to come to God to plead, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But someone is going to say, what about Jesus? Didn't he do away with the law? Aren't we under grace today and no longer under the constraints of the law? And didn't Jesus say that the essence of the law is love, love for God, love for our fellow human person? Of course, law and grace are different words in our theological vocabularies. And Jesus did indeed summarize the law in terms of love. But if we take an objective look at the Gospels in the New Testament, 
we will see that Jesus never once rejected the law. Do not think, said Jesus, that I am come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And not only did Jesus affirm the validity of the law, he amplified the demands of the law. Remember how the law had said, you shall not murder, but Jesus said, if you are even angry with your brother or sister, you are liable to judgment. The law said, you shall not commit adultery, but Jesus said, whoever looks upon another with lust has committed adultery in his or her heart already. And as for Jesus' summarization of the law in terms of love, who of us here today has completely loved God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength? And who of us has really loved our neighbor as we've loved ourselves? It's important, therefore, for us to study the Ten Commandments and by the grace of God's help to seek to live by their guidance. The coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell us as His people has not canceled these Ten Commandments. Instead, the Spirit has put a new heart within us to give us a new power and ability to obey the commandments as never before. And if the Ten Commandments were ever our enemy, as scribes and Pharisees of all generations have tried to make them, they are once again our friend, and we can thank God that they are a divine guide and gift of His love to meet the needs of living in our particular generation. And as John Calvin said, these commandments can be for us like a mirror, revealing our flaws, our sins, the things that we need to change in our lives. The commandments, you see, encourage us to come in humility to the Lord Jesus who came into the world not to condemn, but to call sinners to repentance. The Ten Commandments then are our spiritual friend because if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and God's truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Let us stand and, re and respond to this as saints down through the ages have with the Apostles' Creed. Let's stand together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray together. Father, as we heard these words about your commandments and about your law, I guess for many of us it was a typical reaction to see how we've not measured up and to immediately begin to be uncomfortable with the whole idea that you may be keeping a book on us 
But I remember when I was little and my grandmother had a garden. And we would often go and help her in that garden and we would pull things up that were good plants rather than weeds. And she would always embrace us for our efforts and teach us when we did the wrong thing. And we have trust and hope this morning that you're a God that at least loves us as much as my grandmother did. That for our efforts, you embrace us. And when we pull up the good plants, you teach us. Father, I thank you for Tyler watching him this morning and seeing the ready smile on his face and knowing that in his heart he knows no stranger right now. And I pray as we think about the world outside, we would look at that world the way Jesus did, not with fear, not with apprehension, but the way Tyler did, with a smile, knowing that we are servants of the Most High God who has the power to change us, so surely he has the power to change our world. But I pray as we move into our week this week, we would not give away Monday. We would not think and feel and act as if, well, we're not doing too badly for Monday. May we move into that day with the confidence that we are like secret ambassadors at our work, in our families, with friends, when we shop, when we drive, in every way in which we respond to our world, would your love move into us and through us and touch the people that you would like to be touched? God, I ask that we would understand that when the church assembles, the saints don't kind of slip in the doors But in the eyes of the heavenlies, in the eyes of the principalities, the saints of God carried in with your power and your love and your plan come in as an army. Thank you that your church is also a hospital. Thank you that your church is also a school. We pray for any today that come in and they have sickness of heart or body that you would envelop them, that you would be the, the healer that you've told us you were, that you would use us to speak encouraging words into each other's lives, that we would have a smile, we would have words of kindness. Father, thank you for what you're doing. It's good to be your children. It's exciting to be called Christian. We love being your people. We love the way you surprise us, the mystery of your world, and with expectation and with joy. We remember the prayer that you tried to teach us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us bring to God his tithes and our offerings. <clears throat>
Father, everything that we have is yours. We give some of it back with the expectation of the little boy with loaves and fishes that you would multiply it, you would use it, and you would feed many, many people. Amen. Our next hymn is number 376, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. As you go forth from this sanctuary today, extol the law of God. Meditate upon God's law day and night. Apply it to your living. Follow it daily as you go through your chores and responsibilities. And if you do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will descend upon you and abide with you forever. Amen. <laughs>